We have two more terrific speakers. The first one is Susan Anderson from Harvard. Susan. Thank you, Linda, and thank you both for inviting me. This has been, you know, I mean, I feel like it, it's just a broken record, right? We all keep saying the same thing, but this has just been quite an opportunity um, to participate with all these great people. Um, so I'm one of the few token animal people in the group, I think, and what I like to do is to actually try to take what's known in the clinic and bring it down to the animal level, and let's try to get to some level of mechanism so we can potentially find new ways to actually treat. And so that's kind of my goal. So I couldn't have been set up any better by the talks this morning in terms of looking at adolescent risk for substance use. So I've actually cut out a number of my clinical talk slides because I was also heard that too much of an intro could be a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard a lot today. All right, so I'm going to talk briefly about reward processing. Um, we're going to talk about normal age-related changes in the dopamine system, and especially the prefrontal cortex dopamine system. Um, we have found a way to genetically um, engineer our animals so that we actually can have elevated cortical output in the animals. We can actually then turn that off and look at the results of what happens when you have too little output in that same system. And this is going to be my new uh, theme for the day, if either you like it or you don't like it. So, um, because I'm afraid of running out of time, and certainly no, no great set of studies ever happens in a vacuum, um, it's important that I acknowledge uh, the people who are uh, instrumentally involved in making this happen um, with, I would say, probably blush Heather. The majority of the credit goes to Heather Brenhouse and her ex excellent surgical hands for um, doing the track tracing studies that really helped set the baseline for what has turned out to just be, I think, a, probably one of the best series of studies in my career so far. Um, Kai Sontag made my virus, Nadia Freund, shown in the lower left, um, was involved in a lot of the behavioral studies. Britta Thompson is the tech that everyone dreams of and you can't have her. And Jessica Stannis is now new to my lab and um, I'm looking forward to see what great things Jessica is going to do. So clearly the theme for today and yesterday is the inverted U, right? And we know, and we've seen this slide before now, that stimulus use um, changes with age, with peak, um, at least illicit use, illicit use of substances, starting at about 12 years of age and peaking during his young college age years. And I think this just, this is the clinical data. This is kind of the theoretical about talking about the trajectory. So I always talk about the mission of my lab is we study the trajectory, we break it, and we fix it. So here we go, trying to study, uh, to understand what the trajectory is. We can look at it in terms of synaptic density, like Hunt and Locker did how many years ago. We can try it from, in our case, we've taken it to the level of dopamine receptors to look more at pharmacological signaling, and that's going to be where I stay. So we know that as the brain continues to develop and undergo the overproduction and the pruning that follows, it goes, um, it becomes more complex. So the first question that we're going to ask today is what actually happens if we don't prune accurately, right? Instead of pruning like it should, things stay, okay? And we actually did this study, as I'll describe in a few minutes, for a couple of reasons. One is that might be a distinct possibility, but two, for someone who studies adolescence and the ability to study animals, allows us the, the chance to manipulate as we want to. So I don't have to work on a background of constant flux all the time. I mean, it's good for understanding. We understand the flux. I'll show you the flux in a minute. But what do you want to do if you actually want to see what happens to that mechanism if you actually make it stay like it is during adolescence? So in some respects, what we're going to do is we're going to take a D1 receptor and we're going to make it stay. On the other hand, what happens if we make it go away or at least reduce its expression, okay? Now, Adriana shared with us um, the results of teens responding to rewarding stimuli and that when you show them a stimulus, you get a very strong response to the stimulus in terms of changes in blood flow in the nucleus accumbens or ventral striatum. Now we know that a lot of these changes are driven in part by the prefrontal cortex, which plays a significant role. Someone took my drink. <laughs> which plays a significant role um, in terms of risk for addiction and is, is changes quite so during adolescence, such that that balance, if you will, um, changes. And important to those changes, for a dopamine person especially, is the dopamine um, 
neurotransmitter and the changes that happen therein. So I've shown you Adriana's inverted U. You know, the question I always do before I ever start a talk, especially when I, I talk to a number of clinicians in the room, is ask the question is how relevant is what I'm going to say relevant to what you guys are interested in? Okay, so can I actually somewhat get the same kind of picture? So as Linda has elegantly described and we've come to accept and we've lived, if we've known adolescence, we know adolescents in both humans and rats show, of course, increased um, drug experimentation or use, right? There's a strong predilection towards using and trying. They're novelty seeking, they're impulsive. You know, we know from Bayes' study that that wanes with age and yet we also know adolescents make a lot of very impulsive choices as they go. Um, a new one that we haven't talked much about is it's also a period of sexual behavior and we I think we all, you know, actually this took Nadia in my lab to kind of think about it this way. We all kind of think that that just comes up because that's a puberty change and it really could be nothing else. And maybe, thank you, maybe it's something else, okay? So, what you could say though is when you think about all these different kind of more hedonistic like behaviors during adolescence is that they like an awful lot of things. Okay, <laughs> so if we wanna look at, at um, drug responsiveness, for example, and we wanna look at more cortical processing, in our lab we've used this paradigm called place conditioning, which I'll just describe briefly. We like place conditioning because it's a four day paradigm and for someone who studies developmental changes, it gives us the chance to kind of get into very discrete windows pretty quickly. So just briefly, I only have one other slide on this, is we put the animal in a chamber. We determine that he, in this case, has no bias for either side. We then condition him so that he gets saline in one side, cocaine in the other. The interesting thing apart about this is they get two exposures, one hour each, in essence, across two days to the cocaine. And we ask the rat then on the next day, on day four, did you like it? You know, thumbs up, okay? They have no drug when they go in there, so this isn't any sort of pharmacological effect. This purely is, is you had an experience the last two days, tell me how you like it. And what Heather um, found predominantly is, this is the adolescence, is if you look at different doses of cocaine, is that in each case, is, do you see the Adriana curve? Do you see the Adriana curve? At some point, right, you can max out the response. And so this is also kind of consistent with what Charles had explained to us earlier, where when you have them set, when you have an adolescent set that maximum response to what is, is very rewarding, that you're not necessarily gonna get a difference in, in terms of reward processing per se. But if you, if you say comparatively so, we see a shift. Okay, that the adolescents are much more sensitive. And so following the drug abuse literature and the work of Peter Clivus and the like, we started thinking about these little D1 receptors, these little motivational salience receptors that sit on glutamatergic neurons that sit, in this case, the prelimbic prefrontal cortex, or to you guys, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. And how are they actually driving the nucleus accumbens, okay? And so our general hypothesis moving forward right now is that those are the like receptors. So in a study I did in, in 2000, just looking at all the prefrontal cortex dopamine receptors for D1, they show this massive, they show the classic inverted U with day 40 representing an adolescent age, and then they're gradually pruned away. So that bias towards liking hedonic stimuli might actually very well be driven by that D1. The problem is, is, is that they don't tell me exactly what part of that circuitry that they're sitting. So we took the next step. We put in a tracer, a retrograde tracer here. It was taken up in blue, as you can see here. Labels those glutamatergic neurons that we know specifically um, report to the, the, the ventral striatum or nucleus accumbens. And then we asked the question, at least semi-quantitatively, how many dopamine D1 receptors are sitting on those? And what you can see is that, again, strong inverted U, that the D1 that are specifically driving that uh, those nucleus accumbens neurons um, are sitting on those prelimbic projections. Curiously, just to keep it balanced, if we look at the GABAergic neurons, just to see if it really is a shift in distribution or an overall increase, right? Because if you have excitatory and inhibitory perfectly balanced, then you don't, there's no, there's no general increase in output. 
But as you can see, there's no significant change in the inhibitory, so the excitatory part is driven much higher. Okay, so here we are, we're ready to do the like, and now we want to see what happens if we actually can produce some sort of model of sustained risk that instead of having those D1 receptors prune, they're on board. And so here's what we did to try to figure out exactly what their role is in um, rewarding type behaviors, is we made a lentiviral vector, which all it is is it takes a piece of, of the, the cDNA for a D1 receptor, it inserts it into the host, and now it makes D1 receptors where we put it. In this case, it makes them specifically in glutamate neurons, which is shown here, that if this is a glutamatergic neuron and this is a GABAergic neuron, you can see they're pretty heavily and selectively expressed. And we inject it right into the ventromedial hippocampus. So what we showed is that if we look comparatively at um, preferences, I'm just realizing this isn't exactly the slide I thought it was, but that's okay, because if I told you that anyway, you'd understand. So this is what the teenagers do, right? Our adolescent rats normally show a preference, an increased preference for nicotine, whereas the adults are lower. What I'm gasping about is this is not the viral vector data, but the viral vector data is going to look almost exactly like the teenage data stop. Jessica's laughing at me. That's fair. <laughs> this is good when you see your mentor screw up like this. So <laughs> the, the adolescent rats, like the D1 overexpressing um, uh, adult rats, also are going to show preference for that. And Linda Spear has shown us that um, teenagers have this, this um, curious, they, they don't have the strong aversive effects to alcohol that adults do. So here we show the aversive effects to alcohol. Our adolescent rats don't show the same thing, and if, we, if I had shown you the D1 overexpressing data, you would see the same thing as well. Okay, so that we know that increasing the D1 receptors changes um, those adult animals where normally that would have pruned away into a, kind of a hedonic seeking um, teenage rat. Now, wrong way. We also know that if we overexpress D1, and this is all the right data now, and we ask the question, if they're going to drink sucrose, so you have a two-bottle sucrose preference, do you like sucrose more? The animals that are overexpressing D1, as compared to, in this case, this is a virus, and uh, just a control virus. So how many of you have seen pictures of, like, the green bunny, you know, where it's overexpressing green fluorescent protein? It's the same protein that's injected in these animals. So we have an increase in preferences for sucrose. It has to do with the sweet, because they also show preference for sucrose. If we actually just look at the animals that are drinking a lot of sucrose, they actually gain more weight, okay? So one possibility of this is this also might be in, involved in some of the switches that happen for at least half a likelihood for eating disorders in a sense of that there's now a drive to actually maybe compulsively eat at some point. They also, D1 overexpressing adults now also have higher novelty preferences for environments that they haven't been in before. When we actually looked at uh, self drug self administration and um, asked them if they're going to take more cocaine, they took more cocaine at an FR1 schedule, um, not so much at the FR5. Similar to the cocaine place conditioning, they have a shift in sensitivity where they're willing to take more cocaine at the lower doses of cocaine than the control rats, and if we actually put them on a progressive ratio schedule, which means that every time they want an injection of cocaine, one they have to press once for one injection, then the next time they have to press three, then seven, okay? So it gets, they have to work harder and harder and ask the question is what, how much are you willing to work for it? The D1 overexpressing animals also are more motivated to take cocaine as well. Um, earlier this morning, we also heard about the importance of um, delayed discounting. This happens to be one of my favorite behaviors right now. It's a measure of impulsive choice. It has, I think, great clinical relevance that kids, a lot of the high-risk kids that we see are, have problems with delayed discounting where they'll take that smaller reward sooner rather than wait for the larger reward. And so if we put this in the simple T-maze test, again, animals that are overexpressing D1, which we actually think might be more of a model for high-risk use, I'm doing well. <laughs> What we see is that at a short five second delay, all they have to do is wait five seconds to get four times the amount of Reese's Pieces, and they can't. They will go, they will run to the small more than half the time, okay? So they also have problems in with impulsive choice as well. Um, the last behavior that I'm gonna talk about in terms of at least overexpression 
is this one is definitely the work of Nadia Freund. We heard um, some discussion about sexual behavior as well. Is, you know, I was telling you, she's got the red light going on. I kept asking if they gave them wine and candles in the whole in yards. Um, she said they drank the wine, they got the red light. So <laughs> I got the data, that's all I cared about. Uh, so in this case, we um, selectively engineered the virus now, instead of just turning D1 on and you put it in and it stays on forever, we, with the ability of adding doxycycline to the drinking water, we could turn it on, so it would express D1 high, or we could take the doxycycline out and it would decrease the amount of D1 receptor expression, okay? So either they're kind of adolescent-like or they're not. And what we saw is that we saw significant increases in sexual behavior and mounting Actually, you know, as we were talking about yesterday, successes in those attempts as well. Um, so they just, it was an all just gesture. There was actually, <laughs> I'm going to leave it alone. <laughs> Stop right there. <laughs> uh, when you turned it off, the sexual behavior went down for those two days. If you wanted to turn it back on, no pun intended there either, um, <laughs> the behavior went back up and so on. In other words, we, we, we use this as pretty good proof that at least when, when D1 is turned on, the animals are very much hedonically driven. Um, and when you can turn it off, it really, in this case, it's a behavior that comes down to baseline. And as we found out, it's very difficult to find behaviors that don't habituate over time, but you never get tired of sex, so this one worked out just fine. So, so I mean, I think the conclusion is, is this is the like receptor in our mind, um, that it actually produces a positive bias, at least towards um, hedonic stimuli. And so, and this is one of the reasons that adolescents might do some of the things that they do is they're just, I hate to say it because I have one, wired to do it a little bit. So on the flip side, I hate to do it. Usually I like to do glass half full. I'm going to go glass half empty now. What happens when you have two few receptors? Because we've all seen this too. Um, do you have decreased motivation, right? Do you not see some of the same behaviors? You know, do you have more anhedonia? How does that go? So if we actually look at the trajectory, what happens if kids are supposed to overproduce and they don't get there? Okay, oops. So one of the things we did, I'm gonna pick up from Heather's talk yesterday on the early maternal separation model, which in this case, just to just at least emphasize where the difference is, this is um, a model of, of different um, depressive behaviors. This is actually looking at the ability to escape shock and whether or not the animals will or not, given that they've had the opportunity to train that they can escape shock. This is believed to be a prefrontal cortex behavior, okay? And the animals that had um, the early life separation, so four hours of separation from their mom um, for 19 days during early development, when we test them in, in adolescence, actually show more escape failures. They show pretty strong depressive phenotype at that time, and when we go in and actually trace, it actually, they actually show less D1 receptors. Similarly, again, few things that we're able to do where we can actually do repeat behaviors. One is, again, the sucrose drinking test. Here is animals that when D1 is overexpressed, it's turned on. You have this difference I showed you before that they drink more sucrose. When you turn it off, it decreases. When you turn it on, again, it's a sensitivity shift, not an absolute complete threshold. When you turn it on, you have behavior, but when you turn it off, you have a decrease, which in most animal uh, research studies, we consider this a measure of anhedonia. Okay, so to just conclude, increased D1 receptors in the prelimbic prefrontal cortex in our hands increases sensitivity to drug cues, it increases drug taking, Novelty preferences, sucrose intake, impulsivity, sexual behavior, it's a hit parade, isn't it? Loss of D1 is, and on the, on the other side, loss of D1 is associated with depressive-like behaviors. So the glass is half full, you know, we always complain about adolescents being so driven. There's maybe the likes better than the dislike, if you will. And so with that, I thank you very much. <laughs>